Hello and welcome to Let Them Eat Cake. This program will discuss a range of topics exploring ideas around non-state and anarchist solutions to problems generated by the state. The show is being produced by the 5th Gen Cooperative, an outfit deep diving into disinformation, regional conflicts and non-state solutions across multiple mediums from video to written. This, the first episode of Let Them Eat Cake, we speak about the Syrian civil war with two Syrians with different outlooks of the conflict and a discussion around Assad and his human rights atrocities. We hope you stick around and enjoy the show. Let's get on with it. We have a weapon more powerful than the British Empire and that weapon is our refusal to bow to any order but our own, any institution but our own. I'm Sarah. I'm Syrian. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live? You live in London? Oh, I live in. Uh, no, uh, should I? I can't. I don't want to say the exact. I meant the I UK. The, I meant the yeah, UK. Yeah, the UK. Yeah, I live but in the UK. I, I don't know why I said London. I meant to say Britain. <laughs> Have you always lived there? Were you born there? Are you a refugee? Or okay, no. So, but yeah, I've, I grew up in Syria and I left in 2010. So right at the start. It, it was actually a few months right before the revolution. Can you say where you're from in Syria? Is that... Un- yeah, it's dead as so. Come you left? We actually, we just went to like settle abroad. So it wasn't any sort of conflict related leaving or anything like that? Not for us, but like I've got like my grandpa, he he left Syria because he was, he actually became wanted by the regime. That was in the, in the 80s. Okay, interesting. When did Daddy Assad die? 2000. 2000. Okay. 2000, yeah. Okay. Actually, so, it was now, his memorial day before, like two days ago, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> yes, I, yeah. I made some posts. Yeah. But, yes, so uh, while, while you're talking, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Ayham. I am a Syrian, also a Syrian rebel from Tal city. It's a small village on the Lebanese-Syrian border. And uh, it's in the city of Homs, actually. Uh I was displaced from my home in 2013 to uh, Lebanon, and I we stayed on the border for more than seven years, and my family still on the border. They're living, they're not living in a cab; they live in a normal house. So, and I moved to another country for studying right now. But I've lived uh, basically I've lived my whole life on the border, and like it's and during the conflict and everything. So you mentioned, did you you mentioned you were a part of the rebels? Yes, when we say mm. rebels, we're part of the peaceful protesters yeah. rebel. There's, there's like, um, there's like two phases to the conflict, and the start of the conflict is, it, it is amazingly moderate, democratic. Yeah, like every every everything that a liberal Western society would want to back. It, it, this is not something you really saw in, like you did see it in, in Egypt and Tunisia in the Arab Springs, but eh, not really, like, because like there's a lot of Muslim Brotherhood there. Anyway, after the caliphate rose, everything went to shit. And, it, and it's, that's kind of the second phase, but the first phase is, is when you're in uh, homes and, and that's like the golden days where exactly. like, they, were, they were destroying Assad until, until Russia started coming in and bombing them. And the Iranians started coming yeah. in and putting Iran- Iran- from day one. No, no. The Iranians, Iranians have from, been the from day one. Both of them combined is the only reason he's still alive. Yes, exactly. Well, it's it's interesting because I was watching uh, a video that you sent me, uh, the day by day breakdown of territory gained, and I asked the question. I'm like, how did how did Assad uh, maintain power and? I guess Russia and Iran is the reason because uh, based on that map, uh, there was so such little territory that he had uh, held on to. Yeah. I which mean, was if super, you, super fascinating. You won't be able to see it on the audio recording, but this little map right here, where it's green is where no government change happened, where it's red, the most government changes happened, and where it's yellow, the moderate amount. But this is the entire war. So that's where you're seeing power shift is those red areas in there. Mm. And that's, yeah, northern. Because uh, the, the other thing mm-hmm. that I found very interesting is that... The, it was back uh, and forth in the north, really. And, yeah, and the, Hol- the, Holmes, until, the, until chemical weapons started coming in, 
uh, Holmes was legendary. It yeah. was it was it was insane how how well they were fighting and and it's partially like because a lot of the a lot of the like uh colonels and stuff in the Syrian army defected almost immediately because when they fly helicopters into protest and start you know gunning down people with gunships you normally get defectors before that happening there's a very interesting story i want to tell which is nobody talks about it so uh, and uh, in march 2011 to start uh, of the revolution the syrian revolution against assad and his mafia state so we went on peaceful protests in the street in the main cities of syria like homs hama mo most of the part the parts of damascus idlib uh, and their resort too they went on protesting they want demanding freedom and demanding freedom of speech uh, they demanding of democracy and uh, their rights, basically, the basic human rights. Uh, so what Assad did was converting these peaceful protesters with guns and capture them, torture them in, in his prisons, slaughter them. If you look at Banyas, Banyas city, you should look at it. They, there was a whole massacre. That was a massacre. People. Was that, yeah, that the pit? A, the, the, the this one was, the was worse. It was, yeah, it was way before, it was worse than the pet massacre. Can you go it was it? basically, uh, so this massacre happened in Banyas. Banyas city, or Al Bayda, Al Bayda massacre, well known as Al Bayda massacre. This village is in the Syrian coastal area, Lazikia, which is like the main source of power of Assad. All his soldiers, all his people, all his power comes from that area. Okay, so it was th there's this uh, Sunni minority in that area, and they went on protest like everybody in, in, in Syria, just demanding freedom, peaceful protest. Okay, and there's actually a Syrian speech here, make speech about it. Uh, his name is Omar. Uh, maybe you know him, he spoke in the. His family died in that massacre. Yes, his. Okay, it's, uh, so it's, it's Omar Ashuri. Have you heard about him? No. Yeah, carry okay. on. I'm, I probably oh. have. I, yes, I've yes, already yes. told you recalling names is not my strong suit. <laughs> Same. Okay. So, so I, I called. I called her Brittany the other day. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely, she's not a Brittany. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, I, let me just remember the whole day. So basically, this village was protesting, and because they were protesting, the only protest there was at that time. There is not such a thing as fighting, carrying guns. No, no, no one had guns in Syria. We don't have uh, th this such a thing, okay? So they, at one day, militias of Assad entered the homes, okay? And just grabbed kids, family, women, dragged them into the street, slaughtered them, cut their throat, left them, and it captured what they could have captured uh, in their cars and killed the rest. Uh, some of them run into the the forest. Some of them run into the, like there's it, it's, it's a village, so you can hide, and it's your village, so you know where you had and how you can run. Some of the people managed to run and to tell the story, and some people, unfortunately, they were slaughtered there. And it was in 2011. At that time, no ISIS, no rebels yeah. with yeah, guns. Like the it 2011 just... is so early. Like Ex exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, this is ha happened there. Uh, this is one of them. So after what happened there, uh, in my city, as all this, it's a village actually, more like all of Syria, we were protesting and actually what happened, we kicked all of the police from the city. We said, we will protect, if you are, after like, we kept protesting and they kept shooting uh, at us and I have my cousin died in one of the protests. Okay, he was uh, 17 years old. He was a high schooler. And he was just demanding freedom of speech in his country, and he was shot dead by uh, Assad. So we, the, the the people of the city, just kicked the the police and all of the army outside of the city, like the neighborhood, and they stayed on the border of the city and the, like the entrance and the and the entrance of the city, basically. After a couple, I guess after they finished it from Al Baida, they came. The same military groups came from there to our city. We had a small fight with them, actually, because my my city is on the, on the border. So some of them have like guns, 
and it's typically normal in the, in such areas in Syria. Uh, so it has a, yeah, like Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon isn't exactly, you know. It's, exactly. They, they got a yeah. lot of guns. Yeah. In yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. This is the same idea. They had a, they had a gun, and actually, by the way, our conflict with Assad didn't start in 2011. Exactly. They started in 2008. There was the Air Force Intelligence. We call them the Air Force Intelligence of Assad. They came to our city, and because our city just like they do, how to say, they smuggle food they smuggled cigarettes from it just like a typical village on the border they came and collected all the men would like if you have uh, if you did something or not you're gonna be going to jail with no trial without anything just for being in that area at specific time and you were born here that's your the or only fault so this is we had something against the government but we couldn't do anything because we are a small village at the end and it's a whole government and army so they entered it and they captured the, most of the, the people in 2011 too they did that again uh, whatever you are it's you gotta be man or a woman okay under uh, over 16 or 17 years old and you will be arrested the thing is what Assad did and it helped them it helped him in the in the future, you know this propaganda about uh, protecting the minorities and protecting uh, the minorities from extremist uh, rebels. This is helped them. So what they did, they took these people, they arrested them. They didn't uh, get them to the uh, prison or police department or anything. They took them and chained them up, like in a row, women and men, and let them go through this Alawite village. And what Alawite people said. Like, why, why you are doing this? The policeman did said, these people were trying to kill you and slaughter you b based on your religion. So right now, if you don't want to be slaughtered, just come and kill them and beat them and do whatever you want with them. So you that's how it. sectarianism started. Alawites thought that they were protecting themselves from people that are coming to kill them. This is how it started. Is that like the first instance of disinformation coming with, from the Yeah, Assad within regime, Syria, or was that's that... how... That's how, how that's how sectarianism started within Syria. Yeah, well, you want to you want to make sure people are complacent in your regime's war crimes. Saddam did the same thing. Yes, exactly. So he was telling them, if you don't want to be slaughtered, you're gonna fight with us and fight them, no matter if they are guilty or not, based on their religion. You cannot do that. And unfortunately, a lot of people from this specific. People, a group of people, they fall for that and they start doing horrible things. They start stealing, cutting throat, shooting people based on their religion in that area. And that's how it got more complicated. So it was all because of Assad, because he wanted to go in this direction. And he was unfortunately able to get it from a peaceful protest into something of extremism and people fighting each other based on religion because how so was he was it, won. was it an yeah. overnight thing or was it more like a a build-up sort of a um i i don't know whether assad uses the media so much or how he actually he does used, he oh, no, no, he's the king yeah the media. media was going okay. off okay. On that that so, so was weapon, it dude. was it was it gradual steps in the media being like, hey, these people are maybe not the um, best type of people, and then it just straight up was like, kill these people? Straight, like, that... straight up. The, straight up, this, the people in this city, they are terrorists. Uh, they are killing people, cutting throat people. Okay. The army stepped in and helped you guys. You should stick with the army. And they uh, formed something called the National Defense uh, Arm, I guess. In, mm -hmm. uh, in Arabic, in English, I don't know what you called. Uh, Sarah, Defa al Madani, uh, Al Madani. National Defense. Yeah, the National Defense. It's uh, actually from volunteer civilian. They yeah. stepped militia. in. To... Who thought that they were protecting so, the yeah, people? So yeah, it's just a militia. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, militia. it's just a militia, backed by by Assad's army. And so, that's how at what point did um at what point did this stop working? If it did at all, toward at it's least, at least, partially, it's still at least partially, like when when did it start breaking down for some people? Uh, for some people, actually, let me tell you. If you if you if you want to look, if you want to understand the acid the propaganda, you gotta look of uh, you gotta look at his people's uh, economical situation. 
it's it, it's affected them very so at the beginning of of the the revolution and they like they started this propaganda and people believed it and they formed this type of militia this type of militia what they did they would go with the army enter the city let's say they entered homes and the, like they captured the people or displaced the people the Arab, the Arab Sunni this militia's job was collecting like applies from the house uh, fridge uh, bed uh tv anything they could collect and just sell it so at this time even it was wrong for them and some people knew it it was it's false information they don't care because they were benefiting from this uh economical side of it they were stealing uh, and from the houses and the houses you can just steal and go and sell it even right now if you look at ukraine Ukraine and how like yeah, I think the Russian... that's literally what I was thinking in my head while you were yeah, saying the it. Russian the Russian people got they got AC in Syria yeah. yes they got a, a monetary uh, it was almost a monetary um, benefit for these people then um, exactly to, to maintain yeah it was beneficial <laughs> exactly the one one side is beneficial and the other side like he has like between himself he has justification or oh, and like the propaganda is feeding this uh, justification oh my god i'm gonna be killed or kill i'm gonna kill someone or this someone will kill me which is totally wrong and if you look at the protest uh do you know abdul basit sarut right i see the thing is is i read it and i read it in like white american so like <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was saying to sarah is like is like uh, i uh like I, I i pronounced it for the longest time ray ya uh, so like uh, Idlib is Idlib's how you say it, right? Yes, yeah. Idlib. Okay, yes. at least I got that one. But yeah, no, it's like I just kind of like see the words in my head, like kanji, and like uh -huh. it's not something I can read. I just recognize them, and I'm like, oh, it's that guy. You you would definitely know him. He was uh, uh, a goalkeeper actually, he was a football player, football player before the revolution, and he was from Homs. And when yes. the revolution okay. started, yeah, to... no, 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 I've heard this. I've heard of, like I, I vaguely recalling something. Else. Okay, okay, okay. So this guy, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about him. I'm gonna talk about his friend. His her name is Fadwa Sulaiman. She's an Alawite, actually. I uh, me as a Syrian, I, I admire her. She was a hero to me, and she's still a hero to me. She challenged her family. Yeah, challenged yeah, so everyone. I know exactly who you're talking about. So exactly. So that tells you that it was all propaganda it wasn't real but some people as i've said it was beneficial for them and they were benefiting from it so they kept on doing that recently in the last let's say three years uh, this type of uh, capturing and stealing didn't happen much because there's no much such there's no houses to steal actually yeah, <laughs> so that's when some but people... i think there's only three kilometers in the country that haven't seen violence throughout the war and everywhere exactly. else if you look on a war map it's just red because there's bombs everywhere yeah yeah controversial question but i hear it all the time from a lot of western journalists where they say mm -hmm. that assad was doing this because he saw what happened to gaddafi what happened to Gaddafi in what Probably. Which context? Do you really think that he was as genocidal as he was just because he was scared to be thugged in the street like Gaddafi was? Well, actually, so at the first, Bashar al-Assad is a dumb person. <laughs> he actually, no, yeah. no. He's yeah. a very stupid he... and idiot person. Even if I was the president, no matter how much hate I have, I would not drive the country to this situation. Okay, he was a dumb person. At the beginning, he was scared and acted as a fool. Then that where the Iranian role comes. Since like the first year or the, the second IRGC. year. IRGC. Yeah, like yeah. the Iranian, they start controlling everything. Assad has no word. Right now, it's basically Assad, not the, up to him now. That's kind of it's how the RIG, RIGC works. I mean, that's the if same thing in wanted, Southern Lebanon. I believe you. I, I, I can tell you. I believe in uh, 100%. If right now, if you offer Assad a safe passage. He doesn't want the money. He will go w work a minimum wage. He will do that in any other country. He wants to leave, but they will not let him. Do you, what do you think? What do you think be the end point? From my perspective, I think Assad will go. At some point, will go. But what at what cost? This is the question. Assad will go 
this the whole thing syria had so many wars through if you look at the history we fought mm-hmm. everybody we they fought like occupied by the french too we we fought everyone. the french Every, everyone the french. Yeah, everyone was in syria <laughs> yeah like ev- like we fought everybody so at some point all this like let's say invaders gone and syria stayed and this is the same thing what happened to syria i said will go the geopolitical important importance of syria doesn't allow uh, like i said anyone comes they will stay no the russians will leave at some point iranians will leave at some point Assad will leave at some point but like the new formation will be maybe worse maybe will be better I cannot I don't, really how tell. How can it be worse? It's worse. already the worst. Yeah. It's the worst, but like maybe they will just, as like what happened to Palestinians, we cannot just come back to our country anymore. That like this is the worst scenario that can happen. They are replacing the Syrians with the new uh, people, actually. Did, did you see the irony here? People demanded Assad to go. So like Assad, what did? He just send the people outside and he is bringing importing actually and everyone people... left and he stayed <laughs> yeah they are they, they are importing re- another people That's actually that, importing... Sarah, Sarah has a really good point is it's like so many people left syria because of this war it's really just Assad now people like, are still literally leaving until this day like people like, cannot really take just... the economical situation there anymore yeah, like I, over half the population is has been uh, displaced i think i'm not sure if that's ju- internally and externally okay so the future of syria which is we are afraid of more all of us it's like this geographically right now and like if you look at the like how the military and all of this militias are spreading in syria you can see syria turned into three or four territories and i think for the next couple of years it will stay like this unless a big change unless the usa want to step in and just clean all this mess up or make another mess they uh, they, they can't as long as russia's there that's the problem what they needed to do was give the Syrian stinger missiles. Yeah. For starters. All they needed was stinger missiles. They could have used three. Three of those stinger missiles would have made a huge difference in that war because everything was coming from shitty fucking broken down helicopters. Like old Soviet MI8s, dude. Stingers I remember would have some guy, he shot a helicopter with uh, AK 47. Well, shot it down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is how rusty it is. It's actually bad, yeah. It's bad weapons. That was an AK-47, old AK-47 from the Soviet Union era. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we can't, can't beat the AK. Speaking of that, I wanted to talk about, so you were saying the, that there was really no guns in Syria. So I want, I want to talk about engineering and, you know, how the rubble and scrap metal and shells that were dropped on them were then engineered as weapons to fight back against the regime, and they were winning with those improvised yeah, weapons? About, yeah, at the beginning. Uh, yeah, it, it was in Idlib. Uh, some people would gather like the leftover of the rockets and the, uh, the barrels that will drop down on the, their houses and their cities. They would just collect them and try to make some weapons. And most, like, a couple of times, they were able to make weapons and actually win with it and just uh, throw, uh, shut it at Assad's militias and protect themselves with it. But at the end, you cannot, you cannot fight with them. Mm-hmm. No matter how, how, how good it was. Actually, it's a great thing that shows that Syrian people were willing to fight with anything. Some people, right now, I'm in a country that call us Syrians... We are cowards for running away, and we are just runners, and we didn't fight for our country. Every day, I every day I hear it in in the street, on the internet, on the uh, Twitter, on this podcast, television. All they say that Syrians were cowards and they left their country and run away, which is no, actually, the, and they are making comparisons with Ukrainian. I respect the Ukrainians cause and what they are doing is a great for their country yeah. but like you cannot compare us with them well I, I, what i was going to say is that the the conflicts are linked in the aspect that russia was basically experimenting with weapons and shit that they were going to yes, use yes. On yeah, yeah they experimented so, over uh, like 300 as far as weapons. an arms race perspective both, yes yes both yes, russia it, and it was the united part states of it. were testing arms there it, it it was part of it and i think the Defense Minister of Russia 
at one at some point he uh, that goblin made, looking motherfucker yeah yeah a ghoul. he, said, he like, looks like a we, ghoul <laughs> he said like, we tested more than 300 new weapons in syria and they showed uh, a really good efficiency but like the thing is it was all propaganda too because they were testing on unarmed civilian uh, cluster bombs uh, like a majority of people that are killed whenever cluster bombs are used are always civilians. They're just way too imprecise. And Russia doesn't use precision guided bombs. We've seen that in high definition in Ukraine. The, the first bombs they were dropping on the war, the reason they shot down so many of those planes with, with stingers is because they didn't have precision bombs and they had to fly low to drop a manual bomb on their targets. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't even adapt to be afraid of man pads because they just weren't even used. And it's ridiculous that they weren't. And it's because the, the and it's really Obama's fault. The U.S. is just so fucking terrified that we'll forget them again like we did with the Mujahideen. Like we spent years and tons of money and there's a limited amount of stingers. It's not like we can get more. They're, they're in short supply already. So it's a, so like three is a huge deal. And they can do a lot of fucking damage. Yeah. And it's not like there's more helicopters for Assad to get. You the know, stingers are American made, right? And it's mm -hmm. the javelins that are British, right? I think the javelins are American too. It's I think well, uh, I'm the, not a very the, expert on I this think type the, because uh, they never give us this the type N law. Of the N law is uh, British. They're like why? Why didn't they then? Well, well let's let's talk about this. Why didn't well, I, they? I think a big reason is what I just said is that they were afraid of stingers being left behind by the Mujahideen, but number one, Obama is a fucking coward. And Obama exactly. has, Obama has pussy, hesitated. Actually. He made a threat when these chemical weapons started being dropped, right? He, he kept a... on giving red lines. Yeah, he, he said red line, about red that. line. Yeah, well, Never they happened. fuck his red line and moved on. And he yeah. Yeah, once red red you cross the days. line and you know shit's not coming back to you and it's just the red line, is, you shouldn't have done that. Like, he got a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know who else did? <laughs> fucking Abby in Ethiopia, who's waging the fucking most brutal genocide we have seen in a long time. It's not on the scale that Syria was, but it's a very small population of people. Like Darfur also fucked up. Like they're just yeah, well, Darfur with machetes oh and shit. God. Like it's just like Darfur. And Funny thing that I I met a lot. I I went to Sudan. I stayed there one year, and I met people that left the same thing like as a Syrian from Darfur. It was crazy. Since we're talking about Ukraine, I was thinking about this earlier, is that you've seen, uh, I know Canada and Ireland have done this, but they've actually s ruled that what Russia is doing in Ukraine is genocide. And I, where were they in Syria is like my question, because mm -hmm. what I'm seeing in Ukraine, while more people are dying because it's more populated, there's not sarin gas, dude. Like it's not even comparable. Actually Actually, a horrible thing happened in, in Ukraine, but like, it's nothing compared to what happened in Syria. Right now, like, we still discovering stories. Like, if you, I don't know if you see this, yeah, uh, we were talking the about grave the pit, digger the pit guy who went just down came and out. spoke. Yeah, and the massacre video. There's, imagine yeah, that, how many videos that haven't been yeah, published. It, imagine, and that was that was just some guy. He found he wasn't. He was just. He was like an it IT guy, guy or something. Only one guy. Imagine. Yeah, and he found one the video guy. and he got out of Syria to give it to somebody. I can send you a link. Uh, it's an archive. It's more than uh, 23,000 actually. Photograph and videos about the revolution and what happened in Syria. There's a guy, he's doing a great job uh, getting this all information. He's a Syrian. Uh, and he's all gathering and putting it in on open source and online. Uh, I will I will give it to you. One of the m main reasons why we wanted to start in Syria is because open source intelligence really started in Syria. And it was to counter the disinformation that was coming out of there. Duma, for example, I don't know why they try to debate that attack anymore. There is no attack we know everything about more than Duma. Like there is nothing more to be learned from that attack. And Duma, Han, Han Shehun too, Han uh, Shehun. They, but they never even they, they never even bring that one up when, when I hear denials and stuff. You probably hear a lot more than I do, obviously, because you know I work in all these different areas that I'm looking mm -hmm. at, you know, and it's like you're obviously going to be focused on what you're going through. Our mate, for example, he 
He, yeah. Does he focus? Is that dealing with that? I, I, I told I told Jack he is basically the leader of the disinformation network. Yeah, yeah, he's the leader. He focuses on one chemical attack. He oh, the keeps Aaron on. Guy. Yeah, and that's yeah Duma. the Aaron that's, guy. Yeah, it's yeah. Duma. And, and I sent and then, you the video of Duma. That's the New yeah. York Times video that was all open source. Yeah, well, based. well, we have so many Dumas. They don't even we don't even know about it. Exactly, yeah, but there's the so many that... other there's like attacks that have less evidence that they could attack, you know. Yeah. But it's, it's they focus on Duma because that's the one that brought sanctions. And then the people that follow him would think that there was just one chemical attack and that mm -hmm. was Duma, so they well, just just how, how many how many chemical weapons attacks were there under uh, while while Obama was in office? Let's let's just do that between. The time that it started and the time Trump was elected, how many chemical weapons attacks happened and how many people died from chemical weapons attacks? Okay, so 2013 and 2014, there's there's eight chlorine attacks. That's not deaths, that's attacks. Eight chlorine attacks in 2014. And then there's two sarin attacks in 2012. And then three more unspecified chemicals, probably phosphine. Yes, phosphine. Phosphate, we call it in Arabic, I guess. Mm -hmm. In 2016, when Trump came in, there was 10 chlorine attacks. And then the following year, eight chlorine attacks with one sarin attack. And that sarin attack is what finally got somebody to take at least some action. How did the Syrians see Trump's attack on that airbase? How did both sides see it? How how did the propaganda arm deal with it, and how did the the fighting imperialism and uh, um, yeah. actually it helped it feed their propaganda. <laughs> mm. Oh my God, USA is bombing us. The sanction also like the sanction. And that how, how long fighting. until it was rebuilt and operational? It's 2017, wasn't it? In 20, I, yeah. But it was rebuilt I mean, in a few months. I know that. But yeah, there's... this is actually I think you, if you, I'm. I don't. I don't remember the call the, the exact information, but like I think it's right. It's right now a Russian base. But actually, let's see. If if you're looking at the rebel side, uh, for myself, I'm happy for that. Even like when when they killed Qasem Soleimani. I was so happy oh, when that God. happened. It, I, Bro, I, I, I say this all the time. Was... It was diplomatically. It was. It was not the right way to do it. But why miss a chance? And you know. No, that why that miss a chance? World War Two is going to stop for you. The perfect oh way. He died like a dog. Dude, you know they knocked his socks off? Like, they hit him so I hard, know that they he was barefoot. Handle. They knocked all four of his limbs off. <laughs> he was limbless. He's literally, like, dismembered in pieces. Like, uh, like <laughs> you know that when you drop the marionette? Yeah, well, it was, it was, It was brutal. A quick, a quick uh, information about the Arab Spring. Many mm. people try to uh, promote it as it, it's the CIA... Uh, propaganda they are trying to like to destroy the Middle East blah 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 no it's not like this because in every Arabic country the and who is the enemy of the government it's their people if you look at any Arabic country Egypt Libya Tunisia Morocco Saudi Arabia did they wanna, they don't have an enemy Syria Yemen their enemy the government's enemy it's their people so like Build up oppression just popped in. Some people burned himself in the street and it just spread. Saudi Arabia was afraid of spring, the Arabic Spring. And they support mm. Assad, by the way. Oh, well, yeah. Assad. I, everyone in the Middle East is scared of, of uprisings. Exactly. Yeah. In 79, uh, Saudi Arabia had two uprisings. There was the Grand Mosque seizure, which is, like, which is really important and people don't know about. But as a direct response to those uprisings is exactly why they gave into Wahhabism and Islamism and they started appeasing all these like more radical sects because they were like super capitalist at the time. Yes, it was like, I don't know, like some European country like them or like America. They were very like, actually all of the Middle East was like this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, and but, but Iran had the revolution and the same thing happened, that it spawned other protest movements, and a lot of them were very radical protest movements, which, you know, it helped. It's mostly the Arab-Israeli war, but it helped contribute to the rise of, you know, the global jihadism type stuff that's going on. But that's besides the point, because that's not really anything to do with Syria, because it's a very self-contained conflict, regardless of how many people are involved. A lot of people say it's a proxy war, and... 
there no, is a proxy not. war going just on. A normal it, it's the main war, the main was, war it, it, is between the rebels and Assad. There's also some proxy elements going on. It's just yeah. like Ukraine. Ukraine, it's Ukraine versus Russia. There's other people involved helping out. Yeah, but, but it's not a proxy war. My dad it has a very funny uh, saying. He always said it in the beginning of the revolution. Because, uh, so, you know, in, in Middle Eastern culture, if a man looks like a woman, then he's like not a man, really. Okay, so they're like they don't give him the whole. They, he he looks like he doesn't have the uh, the power or to do like a man. So he's like a lesser man. So uh, in that that time, there was a generation of students in universities and high school. They were just like doing different type of hairstyle and like they are being teenagers and different from society. So society at the beginning cast them. And my dad used to say this type of revolution who looks like a woman has more balls than us, grown ass <laughs> man. So that indicates that all of the protests were held by student. It was mainly student and women. Like old men, they were scared. Yeah. to go on protest. The, Harab is the most important Aleppo. city. It was started from the university. There's a misconception around um, Middle Eastern feminism and how radical feminists actually are in the Middle East. A, a lot of these movements are led by women in all kinds of these countries where there's where there's more oppression on women women are more likely to rise up and be leaders of protests. yeah my mom used to go on a protest and actually they kept her, he, she, she worked in a medical clinic uh, it's a uh, that's also another medical and teachers are huge with protests yeah too. my mom used yeah. to go on 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 protest and they just kicked her from the her job before going on protest and actually they then they came looking for her and why she's uh, treating uh, protesters in our home because some of them were injured and just for the, her only fault was being a woman first second going on demanding her freedom for her family and for herself and treating innocent people and injured people that's the only thing she's done how would you say how much hope there is left in free Syrians, the future of a, a revolution in Syria? Are you, do you have any hope left? And if you don't, when did like hope die for both of you? Is this like, when did you start losing hope in the revolution? Or do you by the way, we have... didn't lose hope, no. I, I, I still believe that I will die in the house I was born in and I grow up in, and I will die building uh, a more free country a more democratic developed educated syria that's that's what i believe and that's what i'm planning to do and a lot of students like like me who basically were disabled as teenagers and kids from syria and they were uh, stripping away their country by other forces we all believe that we will die in our country peacefully building uh, free syria more educated, more developed Syria and without Assad. What about, what about you, Sarah? Me, I, I don't know. I feel like um, I'm a bit different. I feel like I don't think I'm going to like die in Syria. Like, I feel like what about, I'm, what about not, I'm just scared. What about of, hope, though? Hope. I feel like I've kind of like lost most of my hope like after Russia got involved. Because every single day it would get worse, and I'm like, "What is this?" Well, it gotta go. Like, if you look at the chart, it gotta go very down and go up. This is life. I mean, you make a very good point. Do you think that living in a Western country has something to do with that? With what? With, with Sarah, uh, yes, I guess. Yeah, with um, with not having like being being an outsider looking in, sort of um obviously knowing people within the country as well do you think that having uh living outside of the country makes it a little more impactful like it's a bit more doom and gloom because of the media and and they're like oh well these these situations are happening and this is happening and the russians are here and iran is here and all of this sort of stuff do you think that that has an impact on it uh, I don't think so. I know a lot of people who've been here for long. I, know, I actually know people who were born here, but they're, like, a lot more hopeful than me. I don't know. Probably for me, I feel like because, you know, my grandpa le left in, like, the 80s, and he died wishing that he would go back to Deir but he didn't even go there. So now, like, I'm thinking, what if that happens to me too? 
<laughs> well, your, your grandfather didn't go. You can go. You will go. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Hopefully, bro. Yes. I think it's safe to say that there's a new type of conflict going on. We're now in a phase where the best thing we can do is information warfare. And so where, where do you think the weakest parts are where disinformation comes in? Extremism. Assad used it as propaganda in the West. It's the extremism part because nowadays every time you argue with someone and, and you're like, Assad did that, they would be like, but what about the FSA? But if you actually look at Assad was like responsible for around 90% of death. I think it's clever for Assad because he actually did win like the media. We say every, every day, Assad's militia come to our neighborhood, take some uh, teenagers and men and women without any reason, kill them. And so as a theory for us, it was to protect our neighborhood. So me and my friend would protect the street. The, my friend who lives in the other street would live there and he lives there and he's trying to protect his home. So basically, FCA, it's mostly like this. Then some uh, def defected uh, officers with more military experience came and they start helping people. The, our mate, the, the one, actually, if you look, there is a guy called uh, the officer uh, Hussein Harmush. He was the first officer from uh, Assad's army defected and created, uh, let's say, the first um, FCA. It was called another name, the, the uh, uh, Free Officers Movement. Okay. It was main reason not to fight Assad, just only protect uh, protesters. It was protection for protesters. It does. That's the whole creation of idea of. FCA. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're, Assad, we're big Assad. advocates for that exact type of militia organizing and and protecting specifically protecting protest and things like that. That's like our big thing is is that is is that um the like the sort of anarchist solution is a solution to extremism and jihadism, where it's like where if you counter it with what was going on in Syria in the beginning with the free Syrians, it's actually very effective for those people to counter a lot of the extremism going on. But it, it kind of falls apart when it's not just those two sides fighting and there's other sides coming in and, and bombing them. And like, you know, it's very complicated, but uh... exactly, exactly. As, I, as I've mentioned, what's the solution for extremism? It the only th solution is to present the facts. Mm -hmm. Syria is not another country. People in Syria are not extremists. No one, they're like, it's uh, even as a religion, there's some people religious, but like in the whole general. Well, it's, it's, a lot of the like uh, guys like who are, you know, like Al Qaeda and stuff, they're not they're Syrian. Not they came in, they came yeah. in after. So that's, no, that's, not that's how Al Qaeda works. That's they come in, they're, they're, they import foreign jihadis into unstable zones. That's what and Al Qaeda wants. To even do. my city, my city is considered very religious. My grandpa was so religious. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, ISIS uh, was actually in control of my city. So when ISIS came, even the religious people were like, what, is, what the fuck is that? I want to make a point that in Syria, even like what count as very religious which is Muslim brothers. They That's are, guess, the this... most religious thing. Is They're the not yeah, like, this is like, you can, if you reach the level, boss level, you would fight with uh, Muslim brother on extremism in Syria. And they see ISIS and other people as, what are you, what the fuck are you doing? They what see the them as extremists. Um, one of the actual, I, I call him the most based member of Al Qaeda, but he's actually, he was against Bin Laden. He didn't want 9-11 to happen. He was really pissed that the Americans came in and just killed his whole army. He trained the guys who did Black Hawk Down. But he was actually in Syria late, it, like uh, uh, past 2017, 2018. And he's in, you know, he's, he's the commander of Al-Qaeda's military. That He came to Syria and he saw what ISIS was doing. And he said it was like perverted and disgusting. So, like, he was one of the big proponents in Al-Qaeda to come to Syria to actually fight ISIS. He was actually almost going to take over after bin Laden was killed, but so many in Al-Qaeda don't like him because he's not radical enough. So he's, he's an interesting guy. He Definitely a terrorist. Interesting guy, though. <laughs> yeah, but, like, but like if you want to understand, if you want to understand, uh, like, 
Assad's uh, relationship with terrorism, it's not a new thing. Bashar al-Assad was following his father's policies and the people around him made him to follow his father's uh, legacy to continue it. Continue it. Uh, the, the, the Assad fathers was focusing on using jihadism and the extremism to his benefit. So he would create a problem and offer himself as and the solution for that. So yeah. the connection between them is a long time ago. ISIS was created by uh, Assad. And Assad you Erdogan, look, Erdogan every... as well. Erdogan released people down in there too. Both released militants at the same time, and and they came in, and they do this, they always do this. Uh, this is exactly what happened in Afghanistan. Jordan and Egypt, they kind of transitioned after the uh, Arab-Israeli war. They didn't want their prisons filled with these people who were like radical Islamists, because they were trying to, you know, do a whole like peace thing with Israel, and it was beneficial to their economics and stuff. So they just released them and sent them all to Afghanistan. So it's like a way of dealing with your prisoners is to go get them killed in someone else's country. But it's also a way to wield political influence to fuck up that country. Yeah, and obviously, exactly. Turkey, exporting, has, Turkey has interests in Syria. Like controlling the ports are huge. Source. That's the, how they call it. Exporting mm -hmm. the terrorism to its source. So they think, which is wrong, I think. They think mo most of the government that like... I have a terrorist. They are not from my country. I should not believe that they are from my country. So I would just send them another place, let them deal with it. I don't care about it. So that's what they did. They sent most of them into Syria. If you see, like, there is people from... Have you heard of Tajikistan? Daesh is... They're reforming their caliphate in Central Asia right now. And Tajikistan oh, no. is a big part of that. So what's going to happen is what, what, what the article we're writing about is that the Taliban are going to continue to be fucking idiots and not give people representation in the government and the tajiks the guy who runs daesh right now is iraqi and he is an ex-hakani network guy but he's an iraqi and he's in tajikistan not tajikistan but the tajik area of uh afghanistan and they're they shot rockets into tajikistan twice just recently so they're they have they don't have soldiers anymore but they still have all their money and the Taliban can't afford to pay their own police and their own military. <laughs> so this is what Al Qaeda did as well, is they came in and they were job creators. Or Osama bin Laden used his wealth to create jobs. Yeah. And that's and that's the main thing that they're gonna use to recruit while the Taliban continues to be stupid. So we're looking at the you have the the Uyghur branch, the Uzbek branch, the uh, the Tajikistan branch the Pakistani branch and the Afghanistan branch, all five of those are trying to form the caliphate again in Khorasan. Are they coming out of the Panjshir Valley? Is that where they're coming out? No, of? they don't really exist. They don't really no. exist. They're just paying people to do attacks. Ah. Uh. So, the, but if this continues and, the, you know, there's a, ch there's a chance for peace right now in Afghanistan. And not a lot, a lot, a lot of countries get this chance after going through hmm. a war that they've gone through and we know they're going to squander it as far as far as Assad goes how do you feel about his use of elections to basically show that all his people love him I actually don't understand how some people believe these elections no they're wait probably... there was election the, yeah, the... <laughs> It's been going for 50 years. It's, 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 uh, it's weird how they'll use democracy as a weapon, a lot of dictators, where they'll be like, see, my people love me. We had an election. But he's yeah, not even 90% of you know, people love him. Because well, if you want Lukashenko, people to believe they, him. Lukashenko, nobody believed him, and he had to go back on it and be like, okay, I didn't win by 90%. It was more like 80 But like, Assad doesn't Actually, have to take anything back. He does. He just no, goes. He just goes forward. No, but no, actually, there is no election. Left. It was there is no election. No, the even no forced election. There is no election at all. If you, there's a couple of people went on the street, just oh my god, Bashar, uh, I don't know slides and like some flags, and they captured a couple of pictures, put it on the national TV, put it on the internet, and that's it. No one actually. I know a lot of people still in Syria. Okay, uh, no one knows if you ask anybody, no one did go anywhere or elected anything or did anything.
How much of those protests that we just saw for the fake elections, do you think people are that loyal to Assad, or do you think no, that they're I, like, I, I push them paid? Yes. Are they, are they paid? It wasn't voted. So no, no, in Al Syria, we did go on a lot of pro pro sad protests, but it was forcibly. So I did. So me myself, I did go and chant for him. But in high, in the in school, in primary school, they did force people to go outside and chant for him just to show, like, publicly show that he's loved. So it's not any different from. Yeah, after this reminds the me. Of the, you posted this thing. It was a funeral, and it's like even at a funeral, you have a picture of Assad above your baby. Yeah. <laughs> The, the the thing the thing that Sarah told you it was right and it was bef right now it's getting worse. So what happened in Hummus? I, I don't know about Damascus, but in Hummus, uh, a lot of students uh, from the university went on this protest. But actually, they know if they call the people for uh, like you know this uh, bro asset protest, no one would come. So what they did. They told the student, we are having a meeting and we want the whole student to be there mm -hmm. so we can elect a new, uh, I think, a board and we will try to listen to your problem and what you have and we will give you a financial uh, grant, okay, financial grant. So please come to the university so we can like discuss all what you have in problem. So as a student in Syria, this is like, you, know, you don't hear it every day. <laughs> this is a rare thing. So a lot of people went to university like to try what's up, see what's happening, and they were like, "Oh, there's not no such a thing. We will just go in a protest and hear some flags and hear some pictures." And of course, no one can say no at this point. They cannot just go back home. So they a lot went of them to leaked the emails as well. They were like, they sent us these kind of emails to just end up in a protest. Hmm. Very interesting. I don't know much about what goes on. In, I see what happens in the free parts of Syria where the bombs fall, but like I'm still kind of fuzzy about exactly what's going on behind the regime. Be besides, like evil wickedness, like you know the dude is Voldemort. Like, but... yeah, because no one can speak. Basically, I feel like mm -hmm. people who know about what's happening in the regime most likely speak Arabic because it doesn't get translated to English or anything. So it's like family members that tell you what's going on. So it's mostly Syrians that know what's happening in regime held areas. That's a very interesting prospect well, because that's the thing with China, China right now, China, China yeah, we don't get any information movement. right now. Um, and they're translating all this Chinese stuff. Oh, yeah, the great us... translation movement. Yeah, yeah, that would, you know. But that's the thing is, is that what what I wanted to wrap with is is just um, to counter disinformation, like you know, maybe who are good sources who who know what they're talking about with the revolution and 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 what kind of uh blue checks do we want to avoid you know like your your vanessa Bealey, aaron mate like mm. mint press types like you know where where do we want to guide people in the right direction to get the right information here yeah that's i feel a, like that's people, a really just good ignore, one to people just ignore like these canadian american people who like advocating for Syria, maybe focus on Syrian accounts, like Syrian people. Do, that do, you, are... do you have any in speci uh, specifically that you would recommend people to follow? Uh, I've got I know like small accounts, but that's that's the sad thing that there isn't like a major account like our mates. We don't have like a major account. Yeah, just there's small no, like, accounts. There's no blue checks. Yeah, just small yep. accounts of Syrians. Basically, group chats. We will try to like to reply to people. We will try mm -hmm. to do uh, some change, but unfortunately, it's just most of them that are state funded. So, I'm yeah. a student. I cannot do much about it. <laughs> Jimmy Dore is a Assad denialist. He has he has the gray zone guys on all the time. He actively denies the Duma attack. You know, and, and you like got that... the Richard guy, that guy who speak uh, Shami with a fake accent. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, no, no, Rich, Richie Medhurst, the, the he's pedophile. A dumb. He's, he's a dumb. pedophile. He's so Sarah is the only reason I know that dude is a fucking pedophile. <laughs> like she is so her. Like that's who you should follow. Is 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 her? I know, like he has a scandal about being pedophile, but like, is it was uh, associated with you, Sarah, or like you just know about it? Oh no! I just know about it. He, he oh okay. He, I think oh, there's evidence. There. There's tons of evidence. There's I looked evidence. into it. Yeah. I, I look into them too. Yeah. Like, dude, them. the dude is a fucking pedophile. Have you seen his music video? Oh my god! <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah. Have you? Have you? You have? Yeah, yeah, I have. Oh He's my god! It's, 
it is he's a moron actually it is gold he's an actual clown dude bro it's like it's like literally sounds like something you would hear on like the the new metal rock station in 1998 (laughs) like it's like the most cringe like hard rock like it's such dad rock like it's so bad i thought we were talking about andy no for a second because he also fakes an accent (laughs) (laughs) no actually the funny thing that like this uh i said propagandist and they're like trying to promote for uh for anti-imperialism uh, when they try to speak about Palestine or Syria or this Arabic causes, they try like to, to fit in by speaking by fake accent in Arabic. Like if you don't speak Arabic at all, it's gonna be better for you. Yeah, it's that it's Russian totally guy. Fake. It's he not had working. The fakest Arabic accent ever. That's funny as. Spot check people by like speaking your own language. That's what they do in Ukraine with the Russian spies and shit now. Yeah, you know, like that's how they found most of them. They just were like, "What's your name?" And then they listen to his accent. They're like, "You're going to jail, pal." Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing about Arabic life right now, if anyone speak Arabic, I can tell in which Arabic country he's from and which city. Yeah, there's they, and like. Uh, Isn't that distinct? Is it? Yeah, yes. the, yeah. Syrian Arabic Syrian, is like yeah. very French. It's very French sounding. And, and especially, it's, no, bro, it's even more French than Beirut. Us, like, in this I didn't, I, look, I just mean, I just mean, like, you have certain, you pronounce certain letters different. Like the one girl we we're talking to from Lebanon, I didn't know she switched to Arabic. I thought she like switched to French because of how French, specifically Beirut, sounds. Yes. Yeah, actually, well, my Arabic because, like, as I've said, we are on the Lebanese border, so we all very we speak the same dialect as Lebanese, basically. A lot of people make fun of me because I speak like well, it's, this. It's it's funny. I showed that I showed the screen recording that you sent me to my boss, who is from Lebanon. Oh yeah, I showed it to and, Sarah because I had to be like, he, Sarah, what is she saying? And he's <laughs> like, yeah, he probably doesn't understand because she switched to Arabic halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> which is like, really funny. I was like, wait, what? But it, what, what? I wanted to just um, the, one of the first interactions I had with Sarah is is really funny to me because she totally got the wrong impression on my opinion about Syria and she thought I totally said that the free Syrian army was like all terrorists and stuff <laughs> do you remember yeah. how much did you hate me in that first conversation <laughs> oh my god you know what you sent me paragraphs I think I just picked yeah, up yeah well I mean I'm a writer like, <gasps> I'm a writer you call so. us terrorists? So, well yeah. there's a saying uh, you cannot make a friend unless he become your enemy first so yeah that would happen to you. All, all, all I was saying is that I'm not a fan of what Turkey is doing. And and that was kind of, and because I'm long winded when I write and shit, like it, I lose the point and it just like, <laughs> and like, I'm like, I'll like, I'll switch context on accident. Like some, I'll say can instead of can't. You're like, I'll just drop the T. So like a lot of times I'll like be saying the worst shit and like, we'll be like, dude, what the fuck? And I'll be like, oh no, God damn it. <laughs> So I have a question that we can finish on um, for both of you. Uh, how do you see Syria ending up after Assad? And do you think that it will end in democracy? Or do you think it will carry on to some kind of other uh, dictatorial power? Or can will I, it be, uh, be influenced, <laughs> influenced by um, foreign nations even more? Will it become basically just a vassal state of another state? Like, what, what do you guys think? So, like, go on, ladies first. <laughs> no, you go, you go. All right, here, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. I'll go first, and and I'll just say that uh, at this point, the way it looks, there is going to be Islamists involved in, in no matter what happens, and I think that needs to be something that needs to be accepted by the West. That so you need to start to understand. The difference between different Islamist groups and even different Muslim Brotherhood chapters, um, I think that would be a big thing. And and not like not being able to, it's it's hard to dance around it because people don't really understand um, how different these groups are. And uh, I I think that if people can accept something that's like an Islamic des- democracy or an Islamic republic, I think that would be much better than what Assad is going on. But I would hope that it would be very democratic, at least in the north. I there's the first step into like if 
what I hope to do and what I think this is the right thing to mm-hmm. to happen is to the West to look at Syria not as their problem or their enemy. It, mm-hmm. with Syria and Lebanon and the whole like, do you know this three countries here? Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, they should be aligned with them, not push them into Iran, China, and Russia. Mm-hmm. Actually, if China is like supporting Iran to just get into the hot water, into the Middle East, uh, Middle Mediterranean Sea, and they are economically controlling Iran and controlling right now, I think part of uh, support the Syrian people. I, I think they should have given them man pads as well. Exactly, exactly. So Syria itself, the only thing we can just let the people, let the people just stop supporting dictators. We will be able to help you more than you know. This region have always been a main key in all of the conflicts through history. The ports being not controlled by Assad. Global trade exactly. benefits economically. For free Syria. You as a Syrian, you, you're born as a trader and want to do trade and like work and be productive. So I think let the Syrian build their countries. We will elect a democratic system because at, there was after the French went and before the coups, the military coups, Syria had like around 15 years of democracy. It was the best in the world. Even America couldn't achieve that. Okay. So I think let the people just live their lives and we will be able to build a better country. We have very skilled, educated people. They they are lo- willing to do and work for, for their homeland. And the future is to be alive with the with like with the West because they need us more than we need them. It's good answer. So, what, what's, do you want to ask the question again, just to refresh for Sarah? I remember. I remember. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think. Uh, I also agree with you. I think to some extent, Islamists, Islamists are going to be involved in like the future Syria, because the the political opposition, which is the democratic part, it was completely a failure. It was a complete failure. There was uh, there was Jolani, there was FSA, and these are all Islamists, but it's like different types of Islamists. So yeah, at the end, I think they will be involved to some extent. Okay, interesting. It's and, still better, and, and, and even yeah. Al Qaeda would be better than Assad. Not, <laughs> not ISIS. ISIS, ISIS probably, you know, if ISIS had the capabilities, like if they just had a, like the helicopters that Assad had, they'd be, you know, probably just as bad. You, you know, like I will say something. I usually get a lot of hate for it, and I will say it again. I wish right now Israel would come and occupy Syria. Bro, <laughs> everything is better than Assad. Even that Israel, was... I would love, I would well, love it... them to come just occupy a whole of Syria. You know, no, you know what? The Syrians living in Jolan Heights are living the best lives. But how, what do you? I asked this earlier. Is this like why is this not declared a genocide? Because the West doesn't want to recognize it as like this. They don't care enough to, to do it. It's probably there's not enough public support behind it. I mean, look at look at uh, Xinjiang. They are uh, now officially i guess calling it a genocide because there's enough uh public outrage behind it i guess if there was enough public outrage behind calling what's happening in syria by assad a genocide i think that they probably probably would i mean it's textbook specifically because he is a different ethnic group and i don't think that matters as much as like him trying to keep power but just by definition because he is a different ethnic group it meets the definition of genocide even better than than most cases do. Yes. Like I already said that I'm not a fan of Turkey occupying a lot of stuff in the north just because of what they're importing. Let's let's be fair about Turkey. Turkey, the the places she occupied, there is some mistakes. There is some mm-hmm. problem. Of course, they are providing electricity. The people are trying to get into life more. I think it's a better the best option we got. Joe Biden actually is quoted as this is that he wants Erdogan out and put somebody in who will support all of the northern Syria back the entire north and get the coalition back together that he wanted Obama to do at the time but he was too cowardly to do I think he's been coward too Joe Biden oh, coward? Right they're all coward they're all cowards, they're all cowards. <laughs> but yeah, every it, politician's it, a coward it, he's rather than do something you know 
something. Some something's better. Yeah, than Yeah, well, I think right I think Trump was was a better guy. I don't know. Maybe a lot of Americans wouldn't agree with me, but like, well, there's a he, lot of Americans that would agree with you actually. But they don't know. <laughs> they don't know shit about Syria, and they don't give a fuck about Syria. So it's no. Trump. I'll tell you that right yeah. now. So so as as far as like your rhetoric goes and attracting people to the cause, don't go for those guys. They're not going to come. But like yeah, liberals, not, liberals, they all suffer from white guilt. Like you can just yeah, trigger the fuck out of them. Yeah, they'll them. support your movement till the end. <laughs> just, just, just make them feel white guilt, and you'll get it. Yeah, them. yeah, that's that's all you need. That's literally all you need. <laughs> okay, that's a good that's a good tip. Yeah, I'll that's try that's a good end. That's a good smart. end. All right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a good point to end. I think. <laughs> end, end it yeah, on, make Jack, them feel white guys. 